Hi, this is your Sapin Bhartia and we are here at the Open Source Summit in Vienna, Austria. And today we have with us once again, Gab Colabro, GM of Linux Foundation Europe. Gab is with us again. Great to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Happy uh, to be here. It's my pleasure to talk to you. And we talk, you know, earlier sometime, twice yep. a year, though. So I would love to know, first of all, I think it's two years of the foundation. Yep. So I'd love to know how is the foundation doing? Just give us an update. Well, it's been... Uh a wild ride. Uh, we've uh, uh, been growing quite a bit. You know, we have now 173 members. We have uh, uh, five projects and we have several projects coming up on the pipeline. I am pretty excited for also the work that we've done, you know, with the public sector, as I shared uh, during my keynote yesterday. Uh, you know, we've been engaging quite a bit with European Union. Uh, something that I didn't actually expect was the amount of policy work uh, that you know we had to do as as we enter really a new era of, of software regulation in in the EU. You know the CRA AI Act. Of course, we are not uh, you know a lobbying organization, but we've had to gear up our you know presence in Brussels and and really understanding what the impacts for the open source community would be of of all these uh, regulations. So it's been. Definitely, I think, a learning experience and a learning experience, honestly, for the whole open source community to really have to, uh, you know, gear up. You know, we're developers, we're, we're coders, and, and now we have to deal with a lot of, you know, legal compliance requirements. It's, it's uh, certainly uh, a sign of maturity, but a, a new challenge. And this is also a thing that developers won't like to <laughs> deal with. Exactly. You know? So, so, so we'll, do, very, we'll do it for them. Exactly. You're in the tightest part. I would I would talk a lot about you know all these things. That but before we go there, I would also like to quickly talk about how different is Linux Foundation Europe from Linux Foundation North America. That's a really good question. So uh, I would first uh, say that you know. Uh, Linux Foundation Europe is part of the Linux Foundation. We don't refer to it as Linux Foundation North America. We, we just really are a subsidiary of the Linux Foundation. And effectively, it's an entry point for the broader Linux Foundation uh, collaboration platform. Uh, we, our tagline is, is you know, uh, uh, collaborate locally, innovate globally. Uh, the idea is really not to create any further fragmentation, uh, but really to reduce frictions for uh, projects that, you know, make sense from a European participation, strong European participation standpoint, from a geopolitics standpoint, or from a purely a uh, legal standpoint to make sense to be hosted in Europe. Uh, think about, you know, uh, grants and the and, uh, uh, sort of amount of public sector funding that here is in Europe. So uh, I would talk less about sort of differences between the organization and more so about what Linux Foundation Europe adds to the, um, you know, broader Linux Foundation uh, uh, services and benefits, you know, effectively uh, as a Linux Foundation member, you can become a Linux Foundation Europe member for free. It's a reciprocal membership. Uh, and likewise, if you're a Linux Foundation Europe member, you can become a Linux Foundation Europe member for free. So effectively, I would say, in addition to uh, all the services and benefits that we provide to our projects and our members uh, that we all know and love uh, uh, at the Linux Foundation, I would say fundamentally Linux Foundation Europe adds um, the opportunity to host a project in Europe, as we said, the opportunity to uh, uh, you know use uh, euros as your primary currency as, a, as interaction for uh, uh, you know um, your memberships and, and funding, and then of course the opportunity to apply for uh, European you know public funding. There's more benefits that we're rolling out, but these are I would say the first sort of three. Uh, Sort of critical ones. Yeah, and I would like to correct myself also, paraphrase the question. Uh, the, the, I was not like drawing the comparison, but yeah. uh, the question was more or less like in a way that when we look at Linux Foundation Europe versus Linux Foundation, yes. because uh, the, the, the fact is that, as you rightly mentioned, that if I look at Linux Foundation Europe, uh, the focus is more on engaging with the public sector, engaging okay. with the policy makers, versus the Linux Foundation, it's like solving a global level problem. Yeah. So 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 I, I just want to correct so that people don't have that, that I'm not asking. Yeah. So, so And if we go back to that uh, focus, as you talked about, 
uh, policy. So can you also talk about in this couple of years, two years, uh, you did touch upon the policy. We will talk about CRAs and other things as well. But just, just talk a bit about how Linux Foundation Europe enables a lot of open source collaboration which was already happening, kernel development happened here, but because of a local body here, that kind of boosts that. Yeah, so I think uh, you, you nail right on the head, um, um, you hit right on the head, the, the fact that, yeah, having a local entity has helped us building uh, much more collaboration in this region, uh, you know, the Linux Foundation already had about a third of its members coming out of Europe. So, uh, you know, we already had a strong support with a global organization. Uh, but through the growth of a local team, uh, we now have about a team of five dedicated folks to the Linux Foundation Europe, uh, plus several other employees uh, um, that are based in Europe. Uh, you know, we were able to, as, as you discussed, a engage much more on the policy side, both um, primarily in inbound, meaning being able to have our eyes in Brussels and ears in Brussels and being able to then uh, inform our members. We have a policy committee uh, that we run under LF Europe um, uh, of what's coming and what are going to be the impact on uh, uh, open source. Um, we have had a much stronger presence at local events. Uh, not only I'm keynoting this event, but really we have been uh, invited in many more uh, sort of local uh, open source events. Uh, we are rolling out the concept of a LF Europe Roadshow, uh, which will be uh, hopefully uh, uh, set events and set of events next year focused on very uh, uh, sort of European uh, relevant topics uh, um, that is meant to be really not in the major capitals. It, it's meant to be, you know, a, a, a local event, uh, uh, you know, with the under the auspices of the Linux Foundation, really having a, a more uh, sort of a better avenue for our projects and our members to engage the local communities in Europe. Uh, we now have, uh, you know, an advisory board that really instead helps us shape uh, uh, our direction moving forward. We have 20 esteemed leaders We're actually having a meeting tomorrow. Uh, we have our LF Europe member summit, which are going to host actually the day after tomorrow here in Vienna, uh, really to provide our LF Europe members with, again, uh, an avenue to uh, maximize the value of the membership, but also provide feedback um, as to how we can, uh, you know, improve along the lines of the priorities of this region. Uh, and uh, we, you know, uh, we are hosting projects that are certainly European specific, but again, as you said before, uh, you know, there are projects, all of our projects are global. It's not that Euro, LF Europe only hosts projects that matter for Europe. I think uh, the Open Wallet Foundation is a great example. It's uh, a global project, very much like, you know, CNCF or, or any of the other projects, but it made a lot of sense to start it in Europe because it was very aligned to, uh, you know, uh, what the work of the, the EU coming down with the IDAS regulation and the European ID. Can you also talk about that, uh, as you're saying, the member growth is also happening, where you have heard the feedback where, you know, thanks that now there is a Linux Foundation in Europe also because yep. that enabled public sector or even private sector to be able to engage with the Linux Foundation, yep. but they were not able to do otherwise because it was not an entity which was based in Europe. Yep. Well, I think the 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 best testament to that is is the we won at least uh, probably f up to five grants. Uh, um, you know, uh, partly for Linux Foundation Europe, I think. Uh, the NGI Commons that I mentioned yesterday is a really good example as we're working with a consortium to really help advise the uh, European Commission on their investments in, in technology. But we also, that also allowed us to apply for grants, the European grants, uh, on behalf of our projects. Um, so we have a couple of projects like AgStack uh, uh, on the agricultural side, uh, uh, um, you know, OS Climate on the climate side that have been able to participate and win uh, uh, European funding uh, based on that. So I think, you know, it's a, uh, 
as I said in my keynote yesterday, it's it's really the new frontier of uh, bringing uh, you know a third actor in addition to individuals and corporates that we really. I think done a fantastic job uh, uh, helping to support pro open source projects. Uh, we now are really creating an avenue uh, for the public sector. And, uh, you know, this is partly was our vision, but partly is also what has emerged uh, by experience in, in the field. You know, um, there is a lot of desire and there is a lot of a stronger participation of the public sector here in Europe. And we are responsive to that. Uh, can you also, uh, since we are talking about drawing the comparison between the North American market and European market, a lot of grassroots development happens there here, yep. but we don't hear a lot of open source work at the corporate level, yep. which is different in the North America where with the Google, AWS, they like to talk about open source a yep. lot. Uh, even when I'm listening to you, I hear public sector a lot. Mm -hmm. So can you also talk about what kind of engagement is there with the private sector as well? Yeah, of course. Well, I think, um, there's two primary factors to that. One, there's simply no big tech in Europe. And big tech has figured out, I would argue that is one of the least kept secret of big tech, how to leverage open source from a strategic perspective, not just from a, you know, cost reduction or talent acquisition, you know, like maybe sort of the generic uh, benefits of open source, but truly how to leverage open source uh, from a strategic standpoint. I'm thinking about, uh, you know, commercial displacement. I'm talking, I'm thinking about uh, creating new ecosystems. I'm talking about developer engagement, successful developer engagement as a sort of critical persona there's talks about the, you know, the developer, the citizen developer, and, uh, you know, big tech has figured this out for a few years now. And so, um, you know, the lack of a comparable uh, sort of large size uh, uh, set of tech firms makes it so that, of course, the, the, the sort of that type of massive engagement uh, is perceived as less. That said, uh, this is still you know, the largest economic uh, area in the world. And you have so many traditional industries that are undergoing digital transformation and they all are engaging in some degree of open source. Uh, in fact, I go back to Finos. Finos has experienced a huge growth this year. We have several banks in Europe and in the UK. And it just so happened that these industries further ahead is not you know, as mature as big tech, but it's further ahead than many other traditional industries in uh, their open source journey. And we are seeing very much every other industry starting to gear up at sort of different levels of maturity. So I fully expect uh, that level of corporate engagement that we see in the US to grow in Europe over the next few years as more and more vertical industries undergo the digital transformation, they quickly realize that open source is a critical component of that innovation process. Mm -hmm. And are there any specifically, like uh, if you look at like, automobile, you know, some of those companies are like Mercedes Benz or BMW and the yeah. ton of industry, you know, those, uh, what kind of engagement are you seeing from those kind of, which are really heavyweights in this space? Yeah, so we have, of course, they're all of our members already. Uh, and they engage in some of the upstream projects, uh, you know, like CNCF or Linux itself. Of course, we have automotive grade Linux as one of our uh, sort of uh, flagship projects, sort of vertically aligned uh, projects. Um, I think there's way more that, that we can do. I think they're just, you know, uh, You're just the tip of the iceberg yeah, exactly. is the tip of the iceberg also like that there it's easier to collaborate at infrastructure level in many ways you know linux kubernetes that's pretty established that you know all that all those layers are effectively dominated by open source it takes that switch that we were talking about in terms of maturity to start thinking on how do we collaborate on industry specific uh, work. I think AGL is a great example. Uh, another great example, we, one project we launched this year is Open Mobile Hub. And Wiles is, of course, focused on the you know mobile uh, industry. 
there's a lot of interest that we're seeing from automotive uh, in terms of you know uh, embedded device and and in uh, a car you know entertainment infotainment um so again i think in terms of the industries uh, automotive is certainly quite engaged uh, but i'm looking forward to having more verticals uh, like we have finos lf energy uh, you know agl uh, lf networking for the telco industry I think you'll see a lot more in the next uh, year or so. Now let's talk about, you know, you talked about public sector initially. Uh, last year we talked about CRA and now there are laws coming in with the uh, AI as well. Now, sometimes what happens, some of these technologies, you know, uh, like bringing regulations before the technology has matured. Mm -hmm. So putting the horse before the car, how do you see it? And I'm looking at it more of a, from the community and technologist perspective. So which should precede what? Innovation first, then you regulate it because we don't even know where the market will go. So what are your thoughts on that? So it's a very complex question, I would say, and I don't know that there is a one size fits all answer to that. Um, I mean, we've seen cases in which the regulation comes too early and then has to be quickly revised uh, you know to cope with technology I think certainly a case uh, can be made uh, uh, and I know that certain folks think the AI act was a little premature um, you know unsurprisingly the the it's it's the Brussels effect, you know. The the you saw a lot of perceived success uh, with GDPR and and sort of the effect that it had uh, around the world, and and they tried to replicate it with the AI Act. Uh, on the other hand, you know, if you especially in a field like AI, uh, if you wait too long for innovation, uh, and therefore, you know, it's often consolidated in the hands of some very large players, then the regulation has a f effectively uh, sort of the side effect of becoming a regulatory moat uh, for which only the large established players can effectively comply with that regulation and that actually staves off further uh, SMEs and SMBs, uh, sort of, sort of the, the nascent uh, open source ecosystem. And so, you know, it, it's a tough balance. I don't know that I have a uh, particular, you know, opinion on, on each of these acts as sort of how timely it has been. Uh, but I certainly have seen, you know, around the AI, the, you know, if you're talking particularly about the AI Act, uh, there's certainly a case to be made that, you know, uh, we've seen a lot of the, the uh, large players jumping on, on pushing for AI safety, whilst in principle that is correct. Uh, you know, uh, certainly the idea of, of creating a regulatory moat uh, is not unreasonable to, to think. How much progress has been made in fixing the issues with CRA? And what lesson we can learn from it when we bring things to AI? So uh, definitely, much better than when we talked last year. Um, you know, individual open source projects and foundations, uh, in other words, called now open source stewards for the first time formally referred as, as you know, with a role in a regulation uh, have been sort of largely exempted by the CRA. Um, I think the large manufacturers, um, you know, have enough, uh, connections to Brussels and, and deep pockets to comply with it. Uh, I think where uh, the risk that I see is still that the small and medium businesses will have to comply with the regulation, but they might not have you know, the technical prowess or the uh, cybersecurity, frankly, prowess or you know, the money to do so. Uh, and so you know, we're very focused on providing uh, you know, standards and tools for our projects uh, to make sure that at least the upstream components that these SMBs depend on are fully compliant with the CRA. And so that SMBs need to only 
you know, take care of the last mile effectively. Um, we are actively working on it and we'll be working the next couple of days with our board and our uh, uh, members to get, you know, their feedback in terms of is this, you know, what you like to see from us. And what kind of engagement do you have with the policymaker, lawmakers, uh, when it comes to these kind of law? Or you are like, we are still in the mode of watching and then... No, we, you know, of course, we are not a lobbying organization. So uh, we, you'll never see us, you know, actively uh, lobbying in Brussels. Uh, but um, we are, uh, A, much more present in conversations. I think uh, after last year, you know, we've built... Uh, channels both with the parliament and, and uh, with the European Commission. Um, I mentioned yesterday on stage that we are the first open source foundation who has been invited to participate to the uh, multi-stakeholder uh, platform for ICT, which is a, a representative body with many uh, SDOs and member states uh, that is supposed to really harmonize uh, the different standards uh, uh, that exist uh, around technologies or digital standards and, you know, uh, including the CRA. Um, so I think we're well positioned to, uh, you know, fulfill the responsibility that, you know, the very valuable project that we host uh, expect of us. Did you make any announcement this year at this event? Yeah, quite a bit. Not specifically for LF Europe, but yeah, we've announced, uh, you know, open search. Uh, uh, there's a major uh, uh, project that moved under the Linux Foundation. Uh, we announced the Developer Relations Foundation. Uh, we announced uh, new benefits uh, extended by the Unified Patents uh, uh, Organization to our Linux Foundation CNCF membership to stave off patent trolls attacks. Um, what else? We announced uh, um, the release of 8.0 release of Valky. You know, there's been quite a bit. It's been, I've had some really good feedback from the community in terms of the news and announcements. Yeah, I have talked to all those projects. So, you know, I have a good story and good update on that. Uh, uh, I think it was in July in New York, there was a Ospos for Good. And yeah. it was a very big event this time compared to that. Uh, what kind of engagement is, uh, because we talk a lot about OSPOs these days, what kind of work LF uh, Europe is doing in that space? Well, we don't see, uh, you know, a specific need for a European chapter, uh, um, you know, of, of OSPO enablement. You know, we have the to-do group that really uh, plays a global role and they actually have a European chapter. In fact, Anna... Jimenez, who, who leads uh, the project, um, is based in Madrid. And so we have already a lot of uh, interesting engagement through the to-do group, uh, both with the public sector and the private sector. Uh, I think uh, we had uh, some of these Ospology live events, uh, both at uh, private organizations like IKEA, uh, talking about new industries moving into open source, as well as, uh, you know, the Dutch tax office, uh, which is a great supporter. So, uh, yeah, we think we're, we're pretty well covered uh, with the to do group when it comes to enabling Europe to to do more in open source. And, uh, you know, with the combination of the now developer relations foundation, really, there's kind of a community of practice, uh, both in the sort of how to contribute to open source and then how to build a successful community with your developer relations. What are the things in your pipeline for at least this year that, hey, this is what LF Europe is going to focus on? Well, for this year, granted, we are in mid of September. Uh, we want to announce uh, there, there's a couple of big projects in the pipeline that unfortunately I can't talk about just yet. Uh, you can tease it. Don't, well, don't go to give more details. Just tease it. Well, I just say from a large European uh, technology company, um, uh, you can figure out which one is it. Um, and um, we will be laser focused on uh, rolling out our CRA strategy, really. That is uh, our big goal uh, to work uh, really on three prongs, um, standardization, uh, tooling, uh, and uh, uh, um, 
sort of processes for our projects to comply with the CRA, you know, uh, uh, really harmonizing the different you know, projects that we have already, like OpenSSF really provides already a lot of the building blocks and components together with uh, SPDX for SBOM and uh, um, OpenChain, uh, really harmonizing these projects to provide them to our broader set of projects uh, with a comprehensive tool chain. And then, you know, research and enablement, uh, because again, of course, we'll focus on our uh, open source projects, but as we discussed, uh, both SMBs and large manufacturers will have obligations. So providing uh, thought leadership and education training uh, on how to comply with the CRA is certainly something that we're closely looking at. And are we also working on some special interest group or SIG or for either SMEs or SMBs to kind of enable? Because what I hear from you is that you're focused more on enabling smaller teams or companies to either comply or, or you know, to be you know, competent. Yeah, we are uh, we are considering. You know, we already have the policy committee, as I mentioned. Uh, you know, we are considering whether the right construct is a special interest group or a committee. But there's certainly going to be uh, an additional venue for uh, our members to um, you know discuss their challenges during their implementation of the CRA. And what are the, some of the pain points that you keep hearing from them again and again? And you're like, hey, yeah, these are the problems that we have to solve for our members, especially who are based in the Europe. I think certainly um, the uh, lack of, um, you know, deeper investments, um, you know, VC backed startups are a big thing where I live in the Silicon Valley. And, um, you know, certainly Europe could do more um, in terms of implementing sort of digital sovereignty and, and a, you know, a more lively startup ecosystem uh, in Europe. Um, if there was more VC-backed investments, of course, we are in a pretty high interest rate uh, uh, um, context right now. So it, it's, you know, uh, this is not free money at this point. Um, you know, on the other hand, you're seeing with the open source AI kind of a flourishing, especially in France, of uh, several AI startups, or even in Italy, I've seen an Italian LLM uh, becoming pretty big. Um, so I think funding is certainly uh, an element. I think the engagement of the public sector is another one that, uh, um, you know, they're good at consuming open source, uh, they're good at sort of contributing open source, but it's not very structured between sort of the massive funding that comes down and sort of the engagement of administrations at every level. Uh, but I would point uh, uh, your listeners uh, or your viewers, better said, to uh, the Europe Spotlight Report, which I forgot to mention, we announced earlier this week is our third year of running a European open source focused uh, research report that has um, some very interesting findings in terms of both opportunities and challenges. But, the, you know, TLDR is uh, European open source is maturing. I talked to Anna Hammerson uh, that, you know, they did a report also on, you know, the whole there is kind of rise of techno nationalism also. Mm -hmm. uh, digital sovereignty is becoming and Europe, you know, with GDPR and it's very sensitive and which is also in a way leading the mm -hmm. world, you know. Uh, how does open source and how does Linux Foundation in Europe kind of balance it out where, you know, open source kind of, I look at it as a universal language. Yep. You know, it, it doesn't matter, geopolitical crisis and conflict can keep ha happening, but people still need resources to live and feed their families, all those things. So this, so what role do you see open source is playing to combat some of these, you know, kind of, you know, not very positive or progressive move to take the word for the world? Yeah, so I think that's a really valid question. and. Um, I think too often for political or commercially motivated reasons, we hear the notion of digital sovereignty mistaken for the world of, for the world of uh, sort of techno-nationalism or balkanization of open source. Um, we've heard over time this idea that you know, in order for Europe to be sovereign from a digital perspective, 
they would have to build their own open source or their own, even worse, proprietary stack. And as you say, open source is global. There's really no need to rebuild a whole stack. There's no need to rebuild Kubernetes. Um, there's no need to rebuild Linux. Um, especially as we've learned, there's always the right to fork. So if you don't like the direction where it's going, well, you have all the rights under the open source licenses to fork those projects. And so I think differently than, uh, you know, or even sometimes uh, people calling for the creation of a European uh, only foundation. And, you know, again, that will lead to fragmentation. Um, so we think the combination of LF Europe and LF really provides this uh, best of both worlds. You know, have a local entity that is Brussels based uh, that can ensure that, you know, the project is hosted in Europe. Uh, the trademark is under European uh, jurisdiction. Uh, but without fragmenting uh, uh, the notion of uh, the global uh, foundation that is the, the Linux Foundation. So I think, you know, that's very much one of the main reasons why we created LF Europe. Gab, once again, thank you so much for taking time out, sit down with us and give us an update on LF Europe. Uh, once again, great insights. And I would love to, you know, sit down and chat with you again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Swapna.